landlords. Most of us have one, all of us hate them. And if I mention mass movements and campaigns against landlordism that involved bottom-up action to smash their power forever, your first thought might be a certain Chinese communist with a little red book and a big plan for China. I doubt you'd think, though, of the small island of Ireland, an island in the 19th century at that. But that's our focus for today, the Irish Land War of 1879 to 1882. Three years of an intense life-or-death struggle that shook the British occupation to its core, raising the spectre of a Red Republic, while innovating new tactics that are still crucial for our class today, such as rent strikes and boycotting. But more about them in a future video. Today we'll look at how landlordism had ravaged Ireland throughout the 19th century and the subsequent birth of the Land League that swore to consign it to the history books. James Fintan Lawler, an agrarian radical and young islander, identified landlords as an English garrison in Ireland, arguing that they oversaw the colonial government at the local level and the institution of landlordism was planted and backed by the military might of the British Empire. The existence of landlordism meant that the centuries-old conquest was not history, but a living, breathing part of daily life in Ireland. The entire system was built on robbery, and no amount of time could make it legitimate in any way. What made this all the more bitter was that most of the so-called Irish landlords didn't even live in Ireland, or even from Ireland. They were often British and resided on their British estates. Landlordism made no economic sense. It was a parasitic relationship of vicious wealth extraction that kept Ireland underdeveloped and subservient to British rule. It weaponised famine and the effects of the Great Hunger can still be felt today as Ireland's population hasn't recovered to pre-famine levels over 174 years later. Lawless solution was to engage in a united struggle for economic and political liberty. For tenants, the true occupiers and workers of the soil to own the soil, and for a republic free from British control. Only by removing landlordism could Ireland be truly free from the empire. Sadly, Lawler passed away before his vision could be realised, but a new generation of Irish radicals were ready to embrace his ideas and implement them in practice for a new era. After the failed 1867 rising, there was much debate amongst Irish nationalists on which direction the movement should take. Insurrection had clearly failed, so some turned to dynamite, individual skirmishers who would bomb key economic, political and military targets in England, whilst others, such as the Fenian and proto-socialist Michael Davitt, embraced an idea called the New Departure. This meant a unification of the separate wings of the Irish struggle, the Fenians, the agrarian radicals and the parliamentarians into a single cohesive force. Any future struggle would therefore attack British rule from three angles. Farmers resistance against landlordism, the Irish Republican Brotherhood as a revolutionary vanguard group set on forming an Irish Republic and the parliamentarians disrupting British laws and ensuring Ireland's interests were not forgotten at the heart of government. These strange bedfellows were an unlikely and unstable alliance for sure. I mean, by 1879, this was actually the second time this strategy had been t tried. As we'll come to see in future videos, the, the alliance wouldn't last. But it was this driving idea that inspired the formation of the Irish National Land League, or just for short, the Land League. These discussions were spurred on by events in Ireland, as it was clear that some kind of action had to be taken. By 1879, the situation was dire. A brief moment of relative prosperity on the land was sent crashing as the threat of another famine lingered. Potato blight meant the value of potatoes plummeted from £12.5 million in 1876 to only £3.3 million in 1878, as the harvest had failed. Despite this, landlords expected tenants to pay the same high racked rents and evictions soared because of this, from 980 evictions in 1877 to 2,100 in 1880. Between 1878 and 1886, there were 130,000 evictions. This hit Connacht and in particular County Mayo the hardest. Connacht was the poorest province of Ireland, 
with the highest number of precarious small tenant farmers and landless labourers living there thanks to the British policy of driving the Irish to hell or to Connacht. This meant that the spark of any resistance was no doubt going to occur in Mayo, the birthplace of Michael Davitt and home to a vast number of militant tenant defence associations. But it was nonetheless clear that all of Ireland was hurtling towards another man-made famine caused by a first for profit. Only this time, unlike in the 1840s, Irish farmers were not going to passively accept this by emigrating to escape the worst. There was going to be a fight. The spark for what would become the land war took place in Irish town, County Mayo. The ruthless landlord Walter Burke, who, was already, who had already doubled rents in 1857, had died in 1879, and his estate was inherited by his brother, a priest. He enforced that should arrears not be paid, he would start evicting the tenants. This demand was even too harsh for his bailiffs who actually resigned in protest. It was decided that this was the opportunity to take a stand. Davitt suggested a mass meeting in, in Irish town on April the 19th, bringing together local leaders to demand rents be cut and make the wider point of denouncing landlordism as a system. The meeting was advertised in the nationalist and local press and 7,000 people answered the call. To get a sense of the radicalism of this meeting and their political demands, it's worth quoting a few of their speeches made that day. Firstly, there was Thomas Brennan, a Fenian and radical standing in the tradition of Lawler, who stated to the crowd, quote, I will tell you that I have read some history, and I find that several countries have from time to time been afflicted with the same land disease as that under which Ireland is now labouring. And although the political doctors applied many remedies, the one that proved effectual was the tearing out root and branch of the class that caused this disease. This is no mere sentimental question. It is the one on which your very existence depends, and any change in the government of Ireland that would not also change the present relations between landlord and the tenant would be a mere mockery of freedom. You may get a federal parliament, perhaps repeal of the union, nay more, you may establish an Irish republic, but as long as the tillers of the soil are forced to support a useless and indolent aristocracy, your federal parliament would be but a bauble and your Irish republic but a fraud. Anybody who has read the works of James Connolly will find an obvious similarity here. Brennan makes clear as, as day that the land and the national questions are inseparable from one another. To proclaim a republic whilst allowing the English garrison of landlords to continue their class tyranny is to have a republic that is still chained to Britain. On the other hand, to address the land question without also severing the British connection is to engage in an incomplete revolution. Ireland would still be subjected to British rule and British oppression and the famines would continue. Brennan demanded a republic that grants economic and political liberty, a clear break from the age-old idea amongst nationalists of Labour can wait. The second speaker to the platform was John O'Connor Power, also Athenian but also an MP for Mayo. He was elected on the back of a mass movement and platform that was focused on settling the land question in Parliament. Now, if you ask me to state in a brief sentence what is the Irish land question, I say it is the restoration of the land of Ireland to the people of Ireland. And if you ask me for a solution of the land question in accordance with philosophy, experience and common sense, I shall be equally brief and explicit. Abolish landlordism and make the man who occupies and cultivates the soil the owner of the soil. Eviction must be stopped at all hazards. O'Connor Power lays out the demand for what is called peasant proprietorship. Put simply, the Land League's slogan, Land for the People. The landlord system could not be reformed to anyone's advantage as has previously been tried. It had to be completely swept away into the dustbin of history. It makes sense then that those who live and work on the land should own the land, not send the fruits of their labour to a landlord who likely hasn't even seen said land in years. It's doubtful they could even point it out on a map. The Irish town meeting was a great success and showed the power of a risen people. Days after, evictions were halted in the area 
and a number of local landlords dropped their rents by 25% to try quell any further discontent. But the people saw through these minor concessions. Despite the meeting only being reported in two newspapers, word got round and new protests spread like wildfire across Mayo, Connacht and later Ireland. David's message clearly resonated with the downtrodden people and it was on the 16th of August 1879 that the Mayo Land League officially became the Irish National Land League with the support of prominent Home Rule leader Charles Stuart Parnell. But the story of the Land League's progress from there will have to be a story for another time. If you enjoyed this introduction to the Irish Land War, please do let me know and I'll continue the series and story of one of the greatest social struggles of the the 19th century. I'm actually currently writing my dissertation on the topic, so I do have plenty to cover on this series. I'd also like to thank San Z for lending his voice to the John O'Connor power quote. He's an excellent comrade engaging in good work and makes insightful videos on a variety of topics. Plus, there's a five hour long video of our chat together, so if that takes you fancy, do feel free to have a gander over. But to end on a call to action, I'll quote Michael Davitt when he said, Instead of agitate, agitate, the cry of the present should be, organise, organise. Sadly, the struggle against landlordism and high rents continues to this day in Ireland and Britain. So I urge you, do to join your local tenants union and carry forth the principles of the Land League into the future to rid the world of landlordism once and for all. Katu is an excellent union across the 32 counties of Ireland and for us, um, East Irish, or shall we say Brits, we have Acorn, another excellent union that I'd encourage you all to join if you can. And of course, if you're in any other part of the world, join your local union there too. And now, as ever, I would like to take, I would like to thank my, my patrons who, without their very highly, incredibly generous support, um, I wouldn't have been able to get this new microphone, which I hope you've all enjoyed listening to my voice on a new, um, impressive bit of kit. I've really enjoyed fiddling around with it and still got a lot to learn, uh, but hopefully the audio quality is significantly better now. Um, yeah, long may it continue. Thank you so much for your support and I never really imagined I'd get this far. Um, when I started the channel so cheers but anyway without further ado I have to give my thanks to the indomitable ever faithful incredible amazing kings in the Helen der Arbeit uh, we have Awu, Deep Red Wine and Tony Guria all legends all incredible much love next we have the Pint Men we have Andy J, Is Dan Ball and Ryan Wilkinson Again, I'll be having a drink in your honour tonight. Thank you very much for your support. And finally, of course, we also have the party comrades. Um, so we have Berrimans, uh, we have Jack, we have Lemon Meringue Kush, we have Martin Barakov, Mod Sognia, I'm very sorry if I butchered that, um, Sebastian Lubajic, um, Simon Bilodo Colbert, and Skelson. I believe that's how you pronounce that as well. Please do let me know because I am terrible at pronunciations. I'm a typical Anglo in that respect. Anyway, thank you for watching this video, comrades. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, And I'll catch you in the next one. Solidarity forever.